So we're here today with Robert Brownell, who is a county supervisor in Polk County uh, and is involved in a lot of interesting leadership work uh, in, in his uh, life of public service. And Robert, we're happy that you're here with us. We thank you for being with us. This is a blog through the University of Dubuque uh, titled Leadership Matters for a Changing World. And Thanks for having me, Jeff. Uh, we're happy to have you with us. And, and so tell me about, how do you, how do you, how did you become a county supervisor? How does that happen? There's a story there. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I'm one of these guys that kind of took it up by the ranks and uh, first was elected um, uh, as a city council member in one of the suburbs. And uh, after six, seven years, I ran for mayor of that city and won. And then uh, after six or seven years there, the position came open for a county supervisor. Uh, in Polk County, that's a pretty much, a pretty large plate. Uh, we had a lot, much larger um, uh, set of issues to deal with because it's Polk County and, um, and then I did in the city. And city's responsibilities are different than county's responsibilities too, obviously. But, but being in Polk County and almost 600,000, well, 500,000 people in Polk County, 600 in the metro, um, we have a lot of the same issues that any metro area has. And uh, those were the kind of things I was interested in taking on. So I ran for uh, county supervisor. And one, um, we run in districts here. We have five of us. East district's about 100,000 people. And um, uh, the one, the district I'm in is uh, one that's exclusively suburban. Uh, I don't have any Des Moines in my district at all. I used to, but uh, after redistricting, I lost all that. So I just have suburban cities in my district now. Okay, well, where did that, where did that sense of You've got a long history of public service, mayor and city council and, and now uh, supervisor. Where did that come from? How, do, how did you get interested in that? It's, uh, it's kind of a long story, but I'll condense it uh, for you. I, when I, I went to a military school in high school and uh, got paroled, basically, and uh, went back to uh, uh, Cedar Rapids Public Schools. And in the Cedar Rapids Public Schools, uh, they were, the school I went to at least, was very interested in politics and, um, and uh, this was, you know, a long time ago, but I really felt the excitement of trying to make a difference and, uh, you know, trying to rally people around a cause, having a vision that you could articulate and uh, keep your eye on it, you know, and, um, and I think those are some of the elements of leadership that, that uh, we see and we can easily identify is a person who has, you know, a level of confidence, self-confidence even, and uh, can, has a vision and can articulate it and get people to understand what that vision is and why it's, why it's a good thing. Uh, some visions are good for the individual, some, some are for the greater good. And I think uh, real leadership, and the kind I liked anyway, was more for the greater good. And so that got me interested in it, and I was involved in um, uh, politics for quite a while. I mean, just as kind of a person who volunteered on campaigns. I uh, volunteered mostly for Democratic campaigns. I uh, worked for Jimmy Carter in 1976 and um, finally saw the light and became a Republican in, uh, in the uh, early 90s. And, uh, and elections around here uh, for cities are nonpartisan. Um, so, but you know, they kind of want to know when, the, when you run for mayor, they want to know what you are, Democrat right. or Republican. Right. Uh, and then as a county supervisor, we're all partisans. So you have to run as a Democrat or Republican. And, and, uh, so I ran as a Republican and, uh, you know, I, I don't know that it brings that much to the table, the partisan side of it. I think, um, issues are issues, particularly on the local level. And, uh, we're able to work together as Democrats and Republicans and try to solve some things and, and see, see some things in common that we identify as, as issues, as problems, as solvable problems. And uh, we can work together on those to try and solve them. Well, I know just a little bit of background about you. Two of your really big passions are you know, poverty, homelessness, and, and mental health. And, and all of those things are tied together, of course. And yeah. why, where did that come from? for you and, and, and what are you focused on now? So where did it come from first? Maybe that's a, a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, and I'll start with homelessness. Uh, you're right, they, these issues, particularly when they, under the kind of giant subcategory of poverty, um, they all kind of blend together after a while. Homelessness, mental health, um, you know, habitual crime, uh, a lot of that kind of thing uh, tends to kind of fall under the area of poverty. and. Um, and so if you could solve poverty, could you solve all those things? To an extent, you could. They each kind of have their own uh, individual elements to it. Homelessness, in my case, uh, I was involved at the county level with uh, conceivably moving a homeless shelter 
uh, from this current location to a different location because the one here in Polk County was too small. And um, they, can only, they can only stay there at night and then they'd chase them all out during the day. And then they'd just be all over the city um, during the day and because uh, they didn't have enough room for them to have a day room or anything. So they had to clean the place up during the day and then let them back in at four o'clock at night. Uh, in the course of trying to move the um, homeless shelter, uh, ran into a lot of public opposition to that. As you can imagine, citing homeless shelters is, you know, very difficult. And so, because nobody wants them close to their neighborhood. Totally understandable. Uh, we had a lot of resistance, and uh, I thought some of the claims that the residents were making were kind of far-fetched, and it um, and, uh, seemed like we had a lot of people who were self-appointed experts uh, when it came to homelessness. And so um, I thought, you know what? Um, I'm kind of a self-appointed expert of my own. I don't really know what I'm talking about either. And so I, you know, grew a scraggly beard and, and uh, you know, got some crappy clothes and stuff like that. Did my best impression of a homeless guy and checked into a homeless shelter just to see what it was like. Checked into two homeless shelters, actually. One of them was this Bethel Mission and one was the, the uh, Central Iowa Services uh, homeless shelter. Checked in as a homeless guy and, um, and I, I learned a lot, you know, and I thought one of the misconceptions that I'd had, which I think a lot of people have, is that, well, you know, for, you know, we're just one paycheck away from making them homeless ourselves, or, but for the grace of God, there goes I, you know, and, and that really isn't true. Uh, homeless people have to really burn a lot of bridges before they're homeless in Iowa. There's a lot of ways not to be homeless in Iowa. And uh, so you have to burn about every bridge you can burn in order to be homeless uh, here. But, and people do that. You know, they run out, they wear out their welcomes. Uh, they stay with family until the family can't stand them anymore. Uh, they've usually got some other attendant problems that go with it. So, uh, so the question, you know, after spending some time in an actual homeless shelter as a homeless person, um, you know, my question was, what do you, what can you do about this? I mean, what's, what's the answer? Right. And uh, the answer is a tough one because um, tough and easy at the same time, actually, but uh, tough because. Uh, there are so many different individual stories as to why a, why a person's homeless. And some people are homeless just for a couple of days, and some people are homeless chronically, like forever. And uh, so, and then there's everybody in between. Um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of, what I found at least, was that there's a lot of mental health issues within the homeless population. Uh, that's one reason they burn their bridges. You know, they, they don't, they can't see beyond their, their actions. Right very well and uh, so there's a lot of that and a lot of that is uh, exacerbated by uh, substance abuse, drugs or alcohol, mostly alcohol and um, and so you have that kind of element in there too so I think people have trouble kind of differentiating between well is the guy a an alcoholic or is he a homeless guy that became an alcoholic or is he homeless because he's an alcoholic uh, or, or what I, so you get this kind of mixture of, of uh, diagnoses that uh, maybe don't apply so, um, so I got involved with, uh, and one, one aspect of leadership I think is important is, is that you have to be willing to do the things you're telling people to do your, yourself. I mean, I, I don't think uh, uh, people respect you unless you actually know what you're talking about and can, you know, can get your hands dirty. So, uh, so I physically went out to other cities and looked and see what other people are doing. And, and under the Bush administration, they started something um, called uh, uh, Housing First. And people are surprised that a Republican president would come up with this idea, but it's a brilliant idea. And what it was was, let's just put these people into a, into a housing unit. It doesn't have to be a house. It could be a housing. It could be an apartment. It could be something like that. And uh, wraparound services. And, um, and that'll, I mean, that will make them no longer homeless, right? So, um, and that model has actually worked brilliantly in places where they try it. The upfront cost is high. Uh, the downstream cost is extremely low. Because what happens with our homeless folks um, that around here a lot is um, a lot of public intox arrests, uh, public exposure, assaults, uh, different kinds of, th of ways to get in trouble with the police. So we're tying up the time of a police officer, we're tying up the time of Broadlawns Hospital, which is usually where they take them. We're tying up the time of a couple of county attorneys to prosecute them, jail time. I mean, the whole, the whole story adds up to a lot of money. So if you can cut that off with a, you know, uh, a lower level kind of home that's safe with some services, uh, it actually works. So those services, you called them surround services, so those are basically they're located and stabilized in a home. I imagine those are then kind of 
uh, customized or tailored interventions depending upon what the person's uh, right. challenges may be? Right. They'll get a uh, case manager, okay. and the case manager will usually be, be a mental health professional, but not necessarily, um, it, but mostly that's what it is. And we will help them uh, navigate their day-to-day -day lives, uh, I mean, at the very least, but normally what happens is we'll help them you know, get employment and try to become self-sufficient. Uh, that's what, what, what we all want to see is, is for these folks to become self-sufficient again. Uh, you're not going to bat a thousand on that, but you will, you will bat a decent percentage. And um, it's called wraparound services. And actually the landlords that we deal with around the metro here at least are pretty receptive to that. They'd rather call a case manager on a misbehaving tenant than a cop because they don't want their other tenants who are you know, well-behaving and paying market rates and all that to see, to see police in their hallways every day. And so uh, calling a, um, a case manager really does work a lot better. And uh, we've gotten some fabulous deals from landlords around the metro here. And, and we've managed to make it work. I mean, I've seen it with my own eyes. I, I was first directed to a guy who had spent the last 12 years out in the woods collecting cans. And, um, and a group I work with a little bit put him into an apartment over by Lutheran Hospital. And, I, and she's like, I'm going to take over to this guy's apartment. And this woman I know, she's like, I'll take over to this guy's apartment. And you can see for yourself what it looks like. And I thought, well, this is going to be a disaster. I mean, this dude has been out in the woods collecting cans and getting arrested for public urination and stuff like this for years, literally. The guy over the course of two years had 570 citations from the police. Wow. I mean, virtually, you know, every multiple times per week, just a, a high cost guy. So they put him into this apartment. And I walk in and thinking, wow, what, what kind of drunken mess is this going to be? And this is me. I mean, I was kind of sympathetic. And, uh, but, but even I thought, this isn't going to work. And uh, we walk in, and the place is immaculate. I mean, the place looks yeah. great. And he's proud of it. And in the two years that he'd been in there, so that she took me over there after he'd been there two years, so they had stabilized him and all that, he'd had two citations. So we went from 500 citations over two years to two citations <laughs> over two years. The cost of that is just is, is just a hard imagine. I mean, it just was tremendous. Now, does the guy have a job? No, he's not selling insurance at, at principal or anything. But, but he is, um, and he still collects cans. I mean, that's what he does. But he is inside. He's at a place that's safe. He's able to navigate his life. He doesn't cause any problem for anybody else, and he takes care of his stuff. And. Um, you know, the cost for society that is, society is very low there, and uh, it's turned into be a safe place for him, and it actually works. So that's kind of what we're working for here is, is that kind of stuff. Um, so you say, well, what, what, what excites you about that? What excites me about that is that you, is finding a solution that actually works. You know, and I think it's harder to do that at a, if you're not at a local level. At a local level, you know, you actually see the effects of what you're doing, and you see it up close, and you see when it doesn't work, and you see when it does work. I think when you're at the state or national level, especially, um, it's just numbers. You know, around here, um, whether it's here or in Dubuque, um, you know, we actually can see the effects of what we're doing or not doing. And even in Polk County, I mean, it gets hard. We say we might say, well, there's 50,000 people in Polk County that are uh, developmentally disabled, for example. That's what the number is, 55,000. Well, 55,000 is a hard number to kind of get your mind around. Right. But if you actually know somebody who is, or a family who has a, has a son or a daughter who's developmentally disabled, it becomes a little more personal, you know, and then you can kind of get your arms around it and, uh, and see what works and kind of keep track of that. I think that's harder to do at a, at a, at a more of a, a national or, or a larger level. So even in Polk County, it, gets, it can be hard to do, but, um, but it's still you're kind of rewarding in that way. Well, let me ask you this. As we wind this up, you know, you're clearly a very talented person, and uh, you could be doing a lot of things with your life. Uh, so the, the audience, a lot of the audience that will see this, there are a lot of millennials. Uh, I guess the question I'd ask you is why care? Why, why not let somebody else do it? Why, why do you care? Well, that's a good question. You know, I think each of us has our own individual uh, answers to that because um, uh, it's easy not to care. And it's, I mean, there's a lot of great things to do here in Metro Des Moines uh, without having to get worried about mental health people or, or uh, autistic people or developmentally disabled people or, or, any, or anybody that's less fortunate. I think what uh, makes this a great city, to me at least, is that I'm not the only one who kind of has, at least in the back of their minds, a idea of what the greater good should be. You know, that maybe there's something beyond just me 
that that really make that really counts for something. And um, and I think I'm not the only one that shares that in this in this town. Uh, there's a lot of us that think that way. And so when you see when you kind of have that philosophy and you kind of have that ethic, and you actually do do some good for people, and may, maybe they become self-sufficient. That's a, that's a home run if they become self-sufficient, and it does happen. Then it's pretty inspiring, you know, and uh, the kind of inspiration you don't get out of just going to a movie or, or skateboarding around or doing doing stuff like that. It's kind of inspiration that kind of drives you to the next thing. So no regrets, no regrets about it. Oh, I got tons of regrets, but <laughs> <laughs> not over this. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, you know, as as I'm. I'm a person who has the privilege of just being immersed in the lives of millennials every single day. And the, listening to you talk, I think will resonate very much with, with what I experienced to be their passion in, in many, many ways. And so I, uh, uh, I think what I'd end with, a question I'd end with is, uh, you know, a lot of people today that understandably so, at least on the political scene, are discouraged and, and kind of pessimistic. I, I'm not. Uh, because uh, uh, I, I have the privilege of being around young people and it's, it's hard not to be optimistic when you're around young people. How, how do you see the future? Uh, uh, is it, uh, where, where are your sources of hope for the next generation of political uh, and civic leadership? And, and, and what do you see hopes happen uh, long after the time of your contributions have, have been made past? Well, we've got a lot of millennials that are contributing uh, in a lot of ways in Metro Des Moines, and that's inspiring because um, you know they've had they're having a real effect. I mean, they're having a, a real uh, time uh, effect on things that are happening here in the metro. So I think that's encouraging to them. To me, uh, you know, for you talk about the discouraging part of politics, and there's a lot to be discouraged about. I mean, it seems like sometimes the rules don't apply to everybody. Um, you know, the rich and the powerful, the celebrity, uh, they have a certain set of rules, the rest of us have our own set of rules. And I'll, I think millennials, to me at least, uh, and then they get, they get downplayed and trashed a lot. Um, but the ones that I work with, which I think are a lot, are pretty optimistic. I mean, they're pretty idealistic, and I, I, I like that about about them. I, not all of them are unrealistic and and uh, you know anti-free speech and, and all that. I think they're uh, they're pretty tolerant folks, and they can make a difference. Um, you know, for me, I was a uh, when, during the presidential primaries, I was a, on Marco Rubio campaign, and the reason I liked Marco Rubio was because his campaign was all about optimism. It was about looking forward with a positive view of things. You know that this wasn't a apocalyptic kind of election. That this wasn't going to be a dystopian future that we have ahead of us, no matter who wins. And uh, and I was obviously disappointed when he uh, got to get out of the race. But I think the message there for me still is that you know we have to have leaders that are articulate that and have that as a vision that that uh, it's a great country, uh, it's a great state that we live in, and uh, you know maybe Iowa is a little unique because we all tend to know each other to a certain extent. And uh, but you can make a difference here, and uh, so I, I hold that out as hope for um, anybody, not just millennials, is that if you want to make a difference someplace, Iowa is a good place to do it because you, it can happen. Robert, that's a perfect place to end. I want to thank you for your time and uh, for genuinely for your amazingly good and I think compassionate work on behalf of uh, uh, you know, who Jesus called the least of these, my brothers and sisters. So uh, thank Matthew 25, right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks thank very you. much, Jeff. Appreciate yeah. it.